My name is Brandon Sterling. I am the board president of Domar Main Street. I want to welcome everybody to Third Degree Glass Factory, one of the primary drivers behind Delmar Makers District, uh, and welcome to the design charrette for Delmar Main Street. Uh, I should also mention that I am a resident of Central West End. So today we'll be talking early on a little bit about Delmar Main Street and how all of us are involved and how you can become involved, and then we'll go through some of the process stuff. Um, as a matter of logistics, there are uh, index cards at your table. We ask that you hold questions to the very end. Uh, you can write your name, your question down. Somebody will be by to collect them at some point, and uh, we'll run through some, some of those questions at the very end. So, Delmar Main Street is a part of Missouri Main Street. There are three sites here. There is Delmar, there is Dutchtown, and there is Laclede Landing. Uh, we use both a state and national and international model uh, to drive revitalization of commercial corridors. Uh, you can see a slide here. I'm not going to read all of it, but this, rooted is, this work is rooted in historic preservation for us, specifically along Delmar racial equity. Uh, and the idea is that we want to engage property owners, business owners, residents, and institutions that are invested in our local communities and our commercial corridor. So how did we get here? Um, there were a number of really great uh, signs, an alignment of stars. Uh, first, Missouri Main Street was recommended by St. Louis's 230-2030 job plan. And in addition, um, it was uh, specifically identified as SLDC as a program that our community could benefit from and is mentioned in the St. Louis Equitable Plan as well. So our partnership with Missouri Main Street has a three-year commitment, and the idea is that at the end of that time, we will be self-sustaining. Um, we'll be working on these particular items, which is, again, historic preservation, creating a commercial corridor that is walkable, that is inviting, that feels safe. Uh, in addition, that we drive attention here, uh, whether that be business owners and entrepreneurs that are looking for a place to be, or potential consumers who are looking for a place to shop. Uh, in addition, that the commercial corridor will be an extension of the neighborhoods to the north and south, and it will be used as a community hub. Here you can see a map of the district, which begins at city limit and goes to Kings Highway. Um, Taylor. Taylor now, right. Um, our, our commercial corridor is a little different in that it has several districts, both existing and proposed, that'll be along Delmar. You can take a peek. This is our list of board members. Uh, I'm board president. You can see the, the wide range of expertise that uh, is helping to drive this effort. Our work is centered around four committees. Uh, the first is the organization committee, which I am co-chair along with uh, Jazz Cannon. Uh, our role is to really create relationships, uh, both public and private, to help drive this effort. Uh, we are also uh, primary drivers of the fundraising effort. Oh, and it's also uh, important to mention, uh, especially when you see one of the other committees, we've broken communication into two uh, areas. One is making sure that community members and stakeholders understand Delmar Main Street and what our overall goal is. And a little bit later on, you'll hear about efforts to, to really touch point with residents. Good morning, everybody. So I am Erica Hagan. Um, I serve as the uh, Delmar Main Street uh, Board Secretary and also uh, the chair of our promotions committee. Um, I not only work in the community as the executive, executive director of the Magic House Made for Kids right across the street, I also have the privilege of being a proud resident of the West End neighborhood. Uh, so I serve on the West End Neighbors Association board as well as our development review committee. Um, and uh, needless to say, I'm vested <laughs> in the community. And so uh, I have a hunch that like myself, you all 
to see uh, the gyms and recognize the gyms along the Del Mar uh, corridor. And so promotions to us is selling the image um, and the promise of uh, Main Street uh, through marketing uh, the district's unique characteristics uh, through avenues like um, mar marketing strategies and promotional events and um, just doing things like that to connect with uh, the community. We understand that an effective promotion strategy forges a positive image uh, for shoppers, for new investors, for new businesses, um, and just visitors. And so the Promotions Committee, in collaboration with our Economic D uh, Vitality, Design, and Organization Committees, are charged with um, promoting uh, or, or identifying existing opportunities um, and then brainstorming new uh, ways to market Del Mar's assets and amplify uh, a positive image for the neighborhoods. I mean, we can do those things through organizing events that promote local businesses and developing, essentially developing a strong, solid uh, brand presence uh, for the Del Mar Main Street Initiative and St. Louis as a whole. So we have a really awesome team and we are really excited about the work ahead. All right. So Lisa Potts, uh, I am a 18 year resident of the West End neighborhood. Um, I serve as co-vice president of the Missouri, um, of the Del Mar Main Street Committee. And I am the chair of economic vitality. So our committee is basically charged with the financial health and well-being of the Del Mar corridor and all of its businesses. Our goal is to um, look at the market analysis and figure out new businesses that want to come in and also really to support the existing businesses that are there. So we're going to be working really closely with promotion and putting on some events. We have an event coming up in April specifically for business owners and um, potential business owners is actually going to be right here um, April 5th right here at Third Degree Glass Factory and it's about teaching um, businesses and entrepreneurs the importance of business, finance and accounting and how to attract capital and build your wealth. So really excited about that but we have a, 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 a vibrant committee some of those committee members are here today, and so we are going to keep it moving with design. Good morning, yes, the best committee. No, <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Tony Smith. I'm a resident of the West End neighborhood. I serve as the co-vice president, along with Lisa, of uh, Del Mar Main Street, and I'm the chair of the uh, design committee. So I'm just going to read this um, slide. The design committee will work on improvements to the neighborhood's physical elements while preserving the community's authentic character and sense of space, seeking ways to improve historic buildings and public spaces. We also are going to be concentrating on safety, clean, and green. We're probably not going to have a subcommittee, but just because we have so many wonderful people on the design committee, we think we can just all work, work together because everyone is concerned with safety and keeping it clean and also bringing uh, green initiatives. Um, to the committee. I click. I'm sorry. She is a diva this morning. She <laughs> wanted me to do her slides. Okay. <laughs> so, um, first, before I read this, I want to um, thank our caterer, who is Miss Cassandra uh, Hinton, who is a lifelong um, resident of the West End. Uh, Sandy has been, thank you. Very good. Her business has been official since being laid off in March of 2020. She's always dabbled in the, on the side with baking and selling and light catering for family and friends, and she vends at local area farmers markets and neighborhood events. She sells all homemade products, including flavored butters, cookies, candies, and coffee mixes. And she is a prime example of an entrepreneur that we would like to work with on Del Mar, Maine. So, Del Mar is a um, coin name combined, combining the first three letters of Delaware and Maryland those being the home states of the owners of two abutting tracts of land along the street. An urban legend has it that um, they lived across the street from each other and decided to work together. Isn't that great? Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> According to Wikipedia, the American usage of boulevard often means a wide, multi-lane arterial thoroughfare, often divided with a central median and perhaps with side streets along each side designed as slow travel and parking lanes and for bicycle and pedestrian usage, often with above average quality of landscaping and scenery. What stood out for me was divided 
parking lanes and bicycles. I don't know how safe anyone would be on, on a bicycle on, on Del Mar, but I, but I see it. Aspirational is having above average quality landscaping and scenery. So I'd like for us like, all to work together to turn those aspirations into reality. So today we're gonna to be looking at some vacant lots um, that are reimagined and also the um, several properties that are um, currently vacant to um, have renderings of those. Today we'll see some possibilities of what Del Mar could look like with several buildings and spaces we realize. And we'll also get updates on different projects planned or are well on their way along Del Mar. So next we're gonna turn it over to Missouri Main. My name is Keith Wingy and I'm with Missouri Main Street Connection and uh, we're excited to be back in Del Mar. It's always a, a great experience. We've been here since Sunday really, but we started work on, on Monday. Uh, meeting with various sites and property owners, and so um, you're going to see some of the, the great recommendations that our team has. But I'm going to, the, the Del Mar folks did a great job of, of setting the stage for kind of where we've been and, and, and where we're going, so that's going to kind of um, make mine a little more brief, which is great because we want to see all the picture stuff. Um, but we started this pilot program at uh, Urban Maine uh, here in Missouri. Actually, in like 2014, 2015, we started gathering information um, from districts in St. Louis that were interested in this Main Street thing that, that they had heard about. And so, gathered information. Bob Lewis, uh, here in the audience, our board member, um, he and I started meeting with various districts and just having conversations. What were the needs and, and, and what, what, how could we help with, with Main Street? But we needed to build capacity as, as Missouri Main Street in order to, to do this. And so we we're happy to announce um, that Dutchtown was our first pilot urban Main Street program, which we've rebranded as St. Louis Main Streets. And we're very excited to, to get started with, with Dutchtown. And then, of course, the pandemic happened. And so that uh, delayed a lot of the in-person meetings and we moved virtual. Um, but they are, they are moving ahead and, and, in fact, have been doing some great things. And, and we were there Tuesday evening. Then we added Laclede's Landing, and then shortly after we added uh, Del Mar Main Street. And we were here, uh, let's see. Uh, this is our team. I'll let Randy and Joe introduce themselves when we get there. Um, Russ Volmert is the other member of our team, landscape architect, urban planner. Unfortunately, his day job um, took him away today, and he didn't have control over that. But you're going to see his handiwork. Joe's going to present that um, and see some of his designs. But this is where we've been so far with Del Mar. So in May, um, the, the application, the, the district applied ap an application, a review process. In June, we accepted them. Um, in October, we did some board development and training to help get them started. Uh, we were here on site in November and did an assessment, and I recognize many faces from that November meeting. Um, lots of good information gathered from the community, from the various district stakeholders. Uh, I think we met with over 100 people through the, the various stakeholder group meetings, so that was very good. And so we're back here in March with design and, de uh, design and development workshop. And so what we're doing through this process is helping build a Main Street program, like Brandon said, um, build that comprehensive approach to revitalization. And Main Street's been in existence for over 40 years, and there have been urban Main Street programs in Baltimore and Boston for decades. And so we're using them as resources also as we work through this pilot program here in St. Louis. And so this summer, what we're working towards is coming up with transformation strategies, which is <laughs> National Main Street's fancy uh, words for goals and priorities. What are we gonna focus on in the district? We can't focus on everything at one time. So what are we gonna focus on over the next two to three years and then we're gonna use that Main Street four-point approach for implementation. And so we're building a Main Street plan for the Del Mar Main Street District and the Del Mar Main Street uh, organization that then will help us with implementation, finding um, the right partners, finding financing, those sorts of things um, as we move forward. And so we're hoping to present that in the fall and then begin the fun work of implementation. So this summer, though, we're going to work through some educational components. The National Main Street Conference is in May in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, it's always a very exciting to meet with uh, about 1,500 other Main Streeters from across the country and learn from specialists um, that are doing this work across the country, and, and, and that's always good. Our state conference is in July. Um, it's in Kansas City this year. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, Bob is correcting me. 
for, for 15 years, our, our conference has been the last week of July. This year, it is the first week of August. Thank you, Bob. Um, so hope that some of you can make that over in Kansas City. And then we're going to work on, as I said, that transformation strategy and, and building that Main Street plan. So I am going to turn it over to Joe Borgstrom. Good morning, everybody. As Keith introduced me, my name is Joe Borgstrom. I'm the principal of the firm Place and Main Advisors. We're based out of East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, my background, this is unusual for me to do, a little bit of a treat for me to do this today, is to present uh, some, some of the, the uh, concepts for the vacant properties that we've visited. I am not a landscape architect. Russ Volmert from our team uh, did all the, all the nice uh, pictures you're going to see today. My role is as a development finance specialist. So myself and my teams over my career have helped leverage uh, local and state incentives to the tune of about $2.2 billion of private reinvestment into real estate projects. Uh, so my job is really the spreadsheets, and you are not going to enjoy spreadsheets. I guarantee you that this morning. So you're going to enjoy the pictures. I'll talk a little bit about math here towards the end of, of my presentation before I hand it over to Randy. But we really wanted to focus on you know, this design. We actually altered the name slightly because I believe here everybody talked about it being a design workshop. We included the word development because we think this is really important to talk about some of the economics, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. But we focused on, on these three sites, and I'll go into these in more detail in just a second. And then Randy did a, an excellent job. I cannot wait for you guys to see the transformation that, that Randy is uh, proposing for the buildings that he worked with while we were here. But really, what I want to jump into right away is these vacant properties and that was alluded to earlier. The first one is 5900 Del Mar Boulevard. Uh, currently a vacant site. It abuts uh, one of the city parks and has development on each side. Uh, this is what the site looks like from above. And what I also wanted to contrast it with is, you know, I think by popular uh, thought that is one lot, and it is not. When you start looking at the, the actual um, lot lines, there are two lots here, and the lot actually includes that side street of Hamilton Avenue as part of the property itself. So that it lends itself to some really interesting ideas. One of the things that we're proposing for this lot in particular is a short-term use and then a intermediate to long-term use. So the short-term use, one of the things that was shared with us is that this lot has been particularly used as kind of a, a default community space on Del Mar Avenue, that there is, no there is no formal public space along the boulevard. And so one of the things that we wanted to do for a short-term use is to use this clear site as kind of a micro-retail village. And so the proposal here is for several uh, shipping container pop-up stores to allow uh, entrepreneurs to test their, test their uh, business models, uh, probably retail would be most likely. We have a spot on the lower part for food trucks to be able to pull up so we can continue to enhance this space as kind of a quasi uh, public space. And then to improve the connection there along Hamilton Avenue graphically to be able to connect people to the park. It feels very separate when you see the city park there. Uh, it feels like there was a, a definite kind of wall, even though there's a chain link fence and then there's the, uh, oh, what's the, the guardrail at the end of, of Hamilton Avenue. It feels very separate. We want to we wanna remove those barriers and maybe the, the guardrail comes down and bollards go up instead, something that becomes, you know, more easy to interact with. And so we uh, are introducing the thought of having printed street graphics along Hamilton Avenue to help guide people and the, the thought of shoes was very intentional, so we can you know, increase foot traffic, get it? We're very creative. Um, but this idea of creating this pedestrian walkway um, that connects us to the park, we provide a, a temporary space for entrepreneurs to kind of ex explore. Micro retail, we're seeing this all over the country pop up. Uh, we think this is a really good opportunity to help grow your own from an economic development standpoint. So it's not just about how do we attract new businesses, but how do we help provide a space for local entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs from the neighborhoods to be able to come here and be able to have that space to be able to try out that. So that's the short term. The short term would be that we would probably use this for a year or two as we get to a, a point. And then we look at what could possibly go there. And so this is an aspirational uh, photo, what we'd like to eventually see on that site. Uh, and I'll give you a better uh, overview here from an aerial standpoint. We want to maintain that connection in that walkway but eventually put essentially a four-story uh, property on that building with commercial on the first floor and three floors of residential. That, that equals out to about 8,500 uh, square feet per floor for four floors for a total of 34,000 square feet of additional retail, uh, excuse me, of additional real estate uh, into the area. 
Now, this would have to go along with, at some point, too, thinking about formalizing a different spot as a more formal gathering area along the boulevard. We don't want to take that away from the community. But the idea that we could, that we could potentially use this as a more productive spot within the, within the boulevard. Our next spot is 620 Union Avenue. This is at the corner of Union and in, um, Del Mar. Uh, it's a really interesting spot. So one of the things that I'll talk about in a little bit about the economics is the zip codes. So Union Avenue is the zip, is the zip code dividing line between the east side and the west side. And that has very dramatic um, meaning in terms of your market, uh, your market uh, numbers, and I'll talk about that in a second. But this was 620 Union Avenue. Uh, this spot right there is a former gas station. Uh, it's a, adjacent to two houses that are, are probably not in the best of condition. I know that there's uh, some, some thoughts about what to go north of there, so we're not going to comment on the rest of that. But what we do want to talk about is this space in particular at 620. Uh, we had a very productive meeting with one of the owners. What we want to propose there is something not just a one-story. We're actually proposing a two-story uh, commercial property there. Uh, and what we want to see is a cafe or, you know, cafe slash convenience. Uh, I want to be very clear that we're not talking about, you know, um, a party store or anything like that. We're talking about uh, having a cafe. One of the, the benefits of this site, as we look at from, a, from uh, an aerial view, is there's a potential for a uh, metro bus mobility hub, an enhanced area uh, right there. So we think that this would be a really good spot for a cafe slash market you know, for folks to be able to, on their way to or from the bus stop, be able to stop in. Uh, one of the things I want to show, the aspirational thing, I love the idea of having two apartments, about 800 square feet, which is about normal for the area, uh, and then having a rooftop deck, having something for residents to be able to enjoy, so something that would really enhance the area. Uh, you can see that we've got, you know, the Ameren transformers are there at the bottom. You can see kind of how we have things laying off where you'd have the, the pull-in from Del Mar Avenue, but it's, again, it's built you know, to increase density in, on, along the boulevard. So something that would be real close uh, to both the corner of Del Mar and, and Union. Lastly, when it comes to the vacant properties, is 40, 4933 Del Mar uh, Boulevard, which is one of the more interesting uh, uh, lot lines I think we've, we've seen in, in quite some time. I'll, I'll give you an aerial view of this. This is the spot uh, we've referred to as kind of the spot next to Aldi. Uh, when you look at the property lines, this is how this lays out. Um, and it's really interesting because you've got the rest of these two buildings, and unfortunately I didn't include this in the photo, uh, but you've got traditional five, six-story buildings a little bit farther down the boulevard, and while the west part of here along North Kings Highway is very auto-oriented, very kind of post-World War II, 70s, 80s you know, type of, of development, uh, what we're looking at doing is we want to see something more along the lines of a seven-story uh, facility and one of the ideas we have for this is either residential with mixed use with commercial on the first floor or the potential for a Airbnb type of hotel uh, which is a relatively new concept that it's not you know fully staffed it's not a, a flag hotel like a Marriott but it's more of a boutique where it's you know you're looking at uh, several units where you know it is literally kind of an Airbnb situation where instead of being a, a standard uh, hotel room which is between four and six hundred square feet it's more 800, 900 square feet, so it's for ex either extended stays or you know, at least for those folks who prefer to go with the kind of the Airbnb route. Uh, this kind of would be how it lays out. We, ex we anticipate having uh, parking there to the front, and then you could have connection with outdoor dining on, on the street side, uh, and then you can see kind of how, how it lays out from there. This would be seven stories, by the way, at 8,500 square feet per floor which lays out to 59,500 uh, square feet of new real estate in, into the district. So very inspirational stuff. Now the bad news. So I know that we have several developers in the room and anything I'm about to tell you is not news to them. Um, but I, we wanted to present these to the group so you can understand the challenges that the development community is having. And I think that there's a lot of times there's and I don't say, I'm not saying that this is the case here. It happens everywhere else I work. I'm sure it doesn't happen here. That sometimes that there's a little bit of distrust between the development community and the community at large. And what I want to be able to do is provide some validation here to say that this, some of the challenges that you're hearing from developers are true challenges. And I want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, the three biggest challenges that we see for new construction, uh, and this is not just in, in the district itself. We see this as new construction issues everywhere. Um, that the cost of construction per square foot 
we've heard is about $300 per square foot. I would love to hear from the developers, and I know, first of all, if you know developers, I've worked with developers my entire career, I love you guys, but none of you wanna talk about your cost per square foot in front of other developers. Uh, so I would love to have conversations with you elsewhere uh, to see whether or not that $300 per square foot for construction uh, is indeed accurate or within the realm. Um, and then from there, there are no direct incentives. When we talk about uh, historic, uh, excuse me, when we talk about historic structures, the historic buildings, a lot of the properties that you have in the district may be eligible for historic tax credits. That's a big deal in the, in the development finance world. And I'll give you an example about how, why that's a big deal here in a second. And then lastly, the really weird part, as I mentioned earlier, that zip code dividing line, as we pulled comparable rent rates uh, for the district, there was a, a, a defined drastic change in rent rates once you got to Union Avenue. West of Union Avenue, that rent rate dropped to uh, 50 cents per square foot, $1.30 to $1.31 per square foot for, re for, re for residential. To the east, it was $1.81. So it's a 50 cent drop. Now that doesn't sound like a whole lot in the, real, in the grand scheme of things, but when it comes to rental real estate, that is huge. Now the other bad news I have about this is because of that $300, that $300 per square foot, a buck 81 for, uh, per square foot for residential doesn't get it done either. And so one, we've got some challenges that we wanna talk about as it relates to that. So let's talk about cost, uh, cost of construction real quick. I wanna give you the example, the first example that we gave you uh, at 5900 Delmar Boulevard. Four stories, 8,500 square feet per floor. That works out to about $10.2 million in new construction. I heard audible, yeah, you, you guys know I'm not lying. So was, those were developers that made that noise, by the way. They, they, they know this is, a, 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 this, is, this is pretty accurate. So typically what's requested of, of uh, developers, 20% equity, right? 20% down, we, that's typical real estate, $2 million. So that means you're looking at a mortgage on a property of $8.1 million. So typically what we see on average is about 6% uh, for a loan rate. And if developers are getting less than 6%, got yourself lucky. Um, at a 20 year, what we call 20 year amortization rate, when we think about our own home mortgages, we typically do 30 or 15. 20 is what we typically see in the real estate world. That comes down to a monthly mortgage payment of $58,000 a month. If that doesn't make you pucker a little bit, <laughs> it should, because that's a lot of money. Now, then we want to talk about, all right, what about, you know, what about rent rates? What about those things? Well, I'll show you that, what that impact is here in just a second. But I want to show you about, because the important part here for me is that loan amount. On a $10.2 million project, you've got to take out a loan on $8.1 million. That is a huge amount to be able to have on a real estate, on a real estate loan of, of any size. So I wanna show you kind of the impact of incentives here. So construction, cash equity, all these numbers we just talked about, your mortgage payment of 58,000. Now if we're gonna contrast that with a historic building as an example, one that's on the National Register, let's say it's the same uh, project budget. Let's say it's $10.2 million. You got cash equity of $2 million but then you get federal historic tax credits. Now again, if you're a developer in this room, this, what I'm about to show you is a, I will acknowledge, a gross oversimplification of how all this stuff works. And every developer in the room will, will nod emphatically saying, yes, Joe, this is a, this is a gross uh, simplification of, of this, but I wanted to get the point across for those of you who aren't in real estate finance. So federal tax credits, just using whole numbers, 20% federal tax credit, 25% state tax credit, that means your loan is now going from 8.1 million to 3.5. That is a drastic difference in a monthly mortgage payment. When we talk about the challenges of a new construction, why hasn't the market done it yet? This is why the market hasn't done it. The numbers don't work. It's what we refer to as a gap. And per project, that gap could be anywhere from a million to $3 million, who knows? It all depends on the individual aspects of, of each particular project. So let's talk about rent rates real quick. So if you wanna pay for that, you've gotta charge a certain amount, right? If we do that, here's, I wanna show you the zip code of, 
I, I've been referring to him as, as 112 and, and uh, is it 108? Yeah, 108, as the two zip codes. Here's the lease rates on average, based on, based on comparables from this year, based on 25 different units that have been for rent in 2022. So this is very fresh data. You're looking at a buck 30 to buck 31 per square foot, whether it's one or two bedroom, and then the same, you're looking at a buck 82 for one or two bedroom on the east side of Union. When I talk about that monthly mortgage, and we're, even if we're talking about 40 units, it's not enough, and so I'll show you real quick. So we're gonna use that same example of 5900 Del Mar. Four stories, we're not talking about the Taj Mahal, right? We're talking about a nice development, but not overly, um, not overly uh, ex uh, extravagant, thank you, that was the word I was looking for. We've been together all week, you know what I'm gonna say before I say it. So in that case, we, we had 20 units, one bedroom, 800 square feet, 1,120 a month, four units, one bedroom, 1,000 square feet, and if you're a developer, you get this kind of weird thing because sometimes you have leftover square footage, and so you just kind of put it in a, a unit that looks a little bit bigger. Uh, and then we did 12 units at 1,100, two, 12, sorry, 12 two bedrooms, 1,100 square feet for 1,500. And then we had a commercial portion, right? Remember we were talking about the mixed use? Four units at 15 bucks a square foot, which is about average in the, in the, in the area from what we've seen, uh, what we've been, the comps we've been able to gather. And then we assumed that there might be a full, fully built out restaurant. So 3,000 square feet, restaurants tend to at least at a higher square footage, uh, price per square footage, so you're looking at $5,000 a month. $5, a month. That's a total monthly revenue of $57,000 if everything's leased up and everybody's paying on time. Now, if you manage real estate, you realize that once you have that money, it doesn't just go in your pocket. You've got ongoing expenses. You've got to pay taxes. You've got to pay management companies. You've got to do all this other stuff. And typically, at a, at a monthly operating fee, you see if that percentage is anywhere between 35 and, say, 60% of your revenue per month. I was being generous and said 35%. We'll go on the low end. That's $20,000 a month. That means that revenue, is, that, that property is bringing in $37,500 a month. Remember that mortgage payment? That means a project like that would lose $20,000 a month. So we've got to find some way to fill those gaps. We've got to find some way to make that work. So there's a couple of ways to do this. We know that there are, other, there are groups around St. Louis that can help make some of this stuff happen. We know that there are uh, nonprofits that do reduced lending. We know that there's the potential for grants. We need to bring those people to the table as we explore these projects. But do it in a coordinated manner because there are a number of developers who are in this room and we don't want everybody going at them at the same time. We want to have a coordinated ask. Um, so the idea around grants, equity partners who are willing to take a negative return. Now that sounds crazy, probably because it is. But if your choices are between a grant, a 100% grant, or a 10 or 20% loss of your, of your principal, that 20 or 20, 10 or 20% loss of your principal still gets you 90 to 80% of your principal back. So it might be an easier ask for somebody to come and take a haircut on an equity investment than it will be to do, uh, to do a full out grant. Just an idea. Lower financing rates, I mentioned that 6%. If there's anybody else who's out there willing to do a reduced first, second, or third mortgage, so you can break up some of that, what we call the capital stack, some of that, those, those uh, avenues for funding. Now, I will tell you, a lower second or third mortgage is not how second and third mortgages work. Uh, so you're not gonna find a bank do that. Typically, a second and third mortgage are a high, is a higher percentage because it's more risky. But again, we need to find some sort of, of uh, group or some sort of, of mechanism to step in there. I was jokingly referring to it as Uncle Lewis, uh, who could potentially step in with, with money this week. Uh, but this idea that there's you know, the potential to find these additional sources. And then lastly, you know, the other potential is if we're gonna raise rates, then the potential to subsidize those, you still raise those rates, but subsidize. I don't like this suggestion. Because when we raise rates dramatically, even if we did 
that buck 80 to buck 30, if we raise that buck 30 to, to $1.80 per square foot, that's going to force gentrification. So we don't want to displace the residents who are already here. We want to make sure that this is something that folks are still going to benefit from. So that means the rent rates, we've got to try to keep within, within reason. And even in that example where I was giving you about the, the apartments, I raised it to $1.40 and I felt like that was a little high. So there's, there's issues that we've got to deal with here when it comes to, to the real estate, when it comes to the financial gap. But I, I say that not to, not to depress everybody, not to be the wet blanket, not to pour cold water, but for us to realize that there's, this might have been an issue that was invisible to you before. And we want to make that issue visible so we can address it. So that's our challenge. One of the challenges from the Economic Vitality Committee as part of the Design Committee this is something that we need to address to figure out how we, can, how we can make this work. We need developers to make money. We need businesses to make money. That's how this stuff works. And what we prefer is that if we can get development partners from our neighborhood, if we can get business owners from our neighborhood, that that's what we want to do because that's how we build local wealth. But all this is tied together. Now, I get to, I get, I get, I get to turn it over to Randy, and, and actually, Randy's going to end it with some inspirational stuff, and I can't wait for you to see it. But I know we're going to take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Joe. Good morning. My name is Randy Wilson. I'm with Community Design Solutions based in Columbia, South Carolina, where I also have the privilege of serving as the consulting architect to Main Street, South Carolina. And Joe, uh, as an architect and creative, I, I want to thank you for explaining that last bit of information for somebody like me, a creative who is allergic to spreadsheets. Even I could understand that, and, and so I, I thank you for raising my bar of, of, of knowledge about um, those kinds of issues. Before I get into the actual buildings that I had the privilege of studying this week, I felt like it was important to just take one brief moment and talk about some key principles related to the Main Street approach to design, and this is the reason why. You're rarely gonna hear an architect, in my case a recovering architect, say this out loud, while design is important, it's not all important. It is absolutely important because it is the visual manifestation of our place, but it's not all important as Joe just illustrated. Even if we were to make everything look pretty, if we don't address the underlying economy of place, we run the risk of having a very attractive ghost town. And so it's important that we not only look good, but we actually are good. But the reason design is important is based on this very simple fact from the world of sociology. Sociologists tell us that people form their initial impressions and opinions about another human being within three seconds of meeting them. It's based on everything from their height to their weight, their hair color, their skin color, the patterns of speech, their body language. And if that's true of people, I'm 100% convinced it's true of place. Whether we like it or not, the visual appearance of our place affects people's impressions and opinions and judgments about us. If we were in church, that's where you would say, amen, okay? <laughs> so, so I just want to address this from this simple standpoint. As human beings, we have to crawl before we walk, we have to walk before we run, and we have to kind of jog before we sprint. And in the Main Street world of downtown revitalization, it is the same is true of our built environment. Before we can do the difficult redevelopments, before we can do overall building renovations, we have to address things in the short term to buy us time to do those more difficult, more costly matters. So by way of example, almost every place I work in all across America, there's always going to be some percentage of vacant buildings. And you can tolerate a few. But if you have a, a lot, then all of a sudden people can give a false impression and they ascribe to you a perception that may not be true at all, that this place isn't good for business. And so one of the ways that we can take the edge off that is, is what we call vacant building treatments. Now, the most important thing you need to hear in this sentence is the word temporary. These are not permanent solutions, but they're temporary solutions that can buy us time as we occupy these build, buildings with sustainable businesses. And so whether it's pop-up art, vinyl clings, uh, pop-up museums, anything that we can put in those storefront windows to take the edge and the oppression off the fact that the building is empty. And sometimes you can actually kill two birds with one stone. This is Conway, South Carolina. 
These are simple 11 by 17 posters. I mentioned the dimension because it, it, it implies that you can print these off of your home color laser jet printer. And these were simple statements about people and why they love Conway, South Carolina, why they chose to, to put their business here, why they chose to run for office here, why they chose to educate their children here. And what's so beautiful is this is a 100% vacant building, but you don't really care. I mean, you care, but the point is because you're reading these, these statements of people you see at church or in the grocery store your kids go to school with, it has the added benefit of kind of building community pride. And we saw that the last time we were here. We, we put forth some of those um, advertisements about people who are making a difference in this community. People just kind of puffed up with pride about Pride of Place in Del Mar. And so that would be one strategy to address these vacant buildings. Um, we didn't have time to kind of do a full rendering of the Bi-State Bus Garage. But if I can just say it with all humility, that is one dreadful wall. <laughs> I mean, that, the, the experience of walking beh beside that for what feels like a half of a mile is, is just not a very enjoyable experience. And so I would suggest that, that, that we approach the powers that be. Are there some things that we could do in the short term to kind of soften that edge and that wall? And at the top of my list would be things like green or living walls interspersed with panelized murals, both of which would be highlighted by attractive lighting, either coming up or down depending on the day and the time. And that way we would break up the rhythm of this long, monotonous wall with something that is enjoyable, easy to look at, and a much softer edge. Just a word about design education. It was so fun uh, just rock, walking around the other day with, with Rhonda and Tony and, and uh, who else we had, was here? Guy was here. Uh, Erica was here. Lisa. And what we noticed is we, and Guy, I don't know if I mentioned Guy, we started falling in love with your buildings again because we noticed some things that we just didn't notice when we drove. But when you stop and you walk and you investigate these buildings, you realize these really special moments. All right, I got to have credit where credit's due. This photograph right here was taken by Guy. Everybody, Guy, wave at everybody, wherever you are. Okay. So do y'all know where that is? Well, first of all, is, is Lathan in the room? Okay, is Lathan in the room? Okay, you know. Uh, so Lathan, I need to ask permission. May I refer to your building as the Batman building? <laughs> Okay, because to me, it, 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 it belongs on the set of Batman, and I mean that in the best possible way. It is one of the most wicked, coolest buildings I've ever seen in my entire life. This is at the very top of the entry. Can y'all read what it says? The Bolivar, yeah. In this really wonderful, dark, art deco font. It's an exquisite thing. So years ago, in the town of Orangeburg, South Carolina, we did these three things in succession, and I would kind of encourage you to do it here in Del Mar, because every parent in the room knows this to be true about your kids. Your kids learn best when they don't know they're learning. Can I get an amen? Okay. <laughs> you got to make learning fun. So, so what we did is we first held a photo contest. And you know this is an old idea because I was actually using a camera instead of my phone. All right. And so the challenge was you go around downtown Orangeburg and your place, Del Mar Boulevard, and you take photographs only of architectural details. And then you create a pop-up gallery. You take one of those vacant buildings, you put all the photos in there, and you award a winner for that contest. Then you do step number two. Step number two is now somebody has to go on the scavenger hunt and find all of the architectural details that were listed in this photo pop-up. And that person wins an award as well. And then the third step, and you have your choice here, you can develop posters. If you've seen the, you know, the Doors of London posters, this would be the details of Del Mar. And you could sell this as a fundraiser. Now, the last thing you can do is with a little bit of Photoshop help, and I'm happy to show you how, you can take a photograph and convert it into a line drawing and make it a, a coloring book for your children. Because I would love for you to have your kids coloring and learning about the history of, of Call Your Brothers Auto, as you're going to see in just a second, or learn the history of what I'm going to call the, the affectionately the Batman building. And so, the, again, a way to teach our kids about the beauty of the Del Mar and its buildings without them even knowing that they're learning. The last thing I want to say before we jump into the buildings is something we said at the last meeting. If you haven't figured out already, I'm a part-time preacher. Okay, so um, <laughs> there's a passage of Scripture that says, don't despise the day of small things. And I think that is true in terms of downtown revitalization as well. Don't despise the day of small things. Sometimes we have to do little things before we can do the big things. 
And one of the things that we recommended last time was vibrancy amenities. And vibrancy amenities are these very small infusions of color, activity, and interactivity that are born out of you know, interactive games, whether it's cornhole or bocce or giant jingo or giant checkers, giant chess. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the colorful bistro tables and chairs and umbrellas. It's the interactive musical instruments that your kids get to play. It's the before I die, I want to fill in the chalkboard. And it's all of these things that people can do and interact with that, that it can occur at a fraction of the cost of difficult and expensive facade renovations and or streetscape enhancements. Now, here's the part I hate to admit out loud. In terms of just visual appeal, you're going to get an initial bang for your buck off of this more than you will some of those harder gestures. And so it's a great place to start your efforts here. If, if you will please receive this statement as a positive and not meant negative in any way. It's like sometimes you have to fake it till you make it, okay? And these are just affordable ways to just populate the place with these wonderful moments of color, activity, and animation. And so now it's my pleasure to show you some of the, uh, the facade renderings that we worked in. And again, I just want to commend Rhonda and Tony, Erica, Guy, Lisa. You all could not have picked five better buildings for, for me to, to be able to work with. And for the property owners of those buildings, I want to say a sincere thank you for taking time to meet with me and tell me about your aspirations for the building. And I sincerely hope that what you see um, honors what you told me. Now, if you're in the room and you're a praying person, you need to pray for those property owners because they haven't seen what they're about to see, okay? They, they have put a whole lot of trust in me, and we're about to see if it was merited or not. Oh, oh, no, 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 don't go yet. Okay, so here's, <laughs> so here's the Batman building. Where's Lathan again? Dude, I love this building. I, I, I've been an architect for, I think, over 30 years. I have never in my whole entire life seen a building like this. I mean, that terracotta tile and then the glazed tile and the Art Deco entrance, you can just ask anybody I was with. I mean, I was speechless. And they asked me, like, what is this style? I'm like, I don't know. Uh, I mean, and it's part Deco, it's part Byzantine, it's part Aztec. At the end of the day, I said, I frankly think it's Batman. I, I, just, I, I just think it, it looks like it belongs on the set of Batman. So now everybody needs to, what, what's that? So one of the things that, that y'all need to help Lathan and cut him some slack on is, do you understand that because this building is so heavily ornamented, and, a, and the majority of that ornament, as you can see, is this dark, almost gray-black color, he has a lot of limitations in terms of infusing this with pops of color, all right? So in other words, that's the hand he's been dealt. And so understand what you're about to see are going to be very, very subtle improvements, but I'm going to walk you through them. So this is the existing conditions, and these are the proposed. And I'm going to move you left to right, and then we're going to zoom in. So left to right is an existing salon and supplies. Uh, here is a, a, a business, and I'm going to talk about that business in a second. I'm going to embarrass somebody at the same time. Um, this is going to be a bar and grill, and then the final one is, is a restaurant. You can see it has a roll-up garage door and outdoor dining. Now let's zoom in a little bit. So in this second bay... In your midst today is somebody very famous. She, she doesn't want you to know this, but I'm going to let you know. You have a Columbia-trained interior designer in your midst, in Miss Lauren. And so, Lauren, I'm being kind of prophetic. I want to see you open up an interior design firm in that space, okay? Lathan, she's right behind you. Okay, all right, okay. Okay, Nona's is the affectionately called the bar and the lounge that comes next, and then this market cafe would be the, 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 the cafe with the roll-up doors and the outdoor dining. Now, as I alluded to, I don't know if you can see right here, because of the solar orientation, the, the sunlight just beats on this building in the late afternoon. And so he needs some solar relief. And so we're going to use retractable awnings. But before I extend to the awnings in the rendering, I want to explain the color choice. Here is that fabulous, fabulous jaw-dropping entry right here. All this glazed tile, real Byzantine looking. And then again, this, this unglazed that almost looks very Aztec. But look at this wonderful sort of deco period color in this, this sort of pale green and beige. And so that's the color I chose for the awnings when they're fully extended. And so that way we've kind of introduced these, these other two colors in addition to the charcoal and the terracotta. Now we've also introduced this sort of pale green and pale yellow. And if you're a color theory expert, then you know part of the reason that works, it's a triadic. In other words, it's, it's three colors that are equidistant on the color wheel. 
And so that's um, Lathan's Batman building in the after, and I hope we like it. Uh, Mr. Mr. Stan Luckett, right here, thank you so much for meeting with me. And I, I think if you're familiar with the neighborhood that you know that unfortunately, well, let's start with the positives. This establishment's been around for a long, long time. It's a great fixture in your neighborhood, but unfortunately they experienced a fire. And so in the rebuilding process, uh, we, we pondered some ideas about ways to improve this. Now, I want you to pay attention to some existing details. We're going to zoom in in a second. This entire facade is covered with white porcelain glazed brick. This stuff is exquisite. And then around the window surrounds are these, these two tones of green glazed brick. And as you're about to see, up detailed would be these wonderful sort of lion's head keystones. So here's the after photo. And you can see some of the features, of course, we're going to replace the windows, we're going to install a canopy, fix up the transom, and then go back after we remove uh, the, the, the plywood, restore it back to the wood storefront that would have existed something similar to this. I really wrestled, Mr. Luckett, with whether that storefront should be painted green or white, but ultimately I decided on white just because of uh, the presence of all the white glazed tile. It just seemed to be the character of the building, and so I just kind of wanted to honor that. But as we, but as we zoom in, I'm going to get to your name on the window. Um, this, these are some of the details I want to make sure you see in case you haven't paid attention. Or when we have the photo contest, you can be sure to go photograph these, okay? So you can see the glazed tile. Again, I love this two-tone green, and, and look at these lion's head uh, keystones, just exquisite details on this building. And look what happens down below. He's got this wonderful transom glass. Uh, we, we, we installed a canopy so that you could both get light above it to illuminate the stained glass, but it would protect the storefront underneath. And Mr. Luckett, I hope I just took your name and did two tones of green, just like the tile up above for Luckett's Lounge. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, so this is uh, Collier Brothers uh, Auto Body. I Man, I love this, this building. I mean, again, y'all's buildings are amazing. For those who, who might not be familiar, uh, Crest buildings that were built all across America, uh, this building utilizes the exact same polychromatic uh, stone that are used on Crest buildings all across America. And, and again, you can sort of see these pale green and blue diamond medallions that are in it. And, and over time, they've made some necessary changes to bring this use into the 21st century. I respect the fact that this facade just gets beat to death by the sun every afternoon. And so they needed to reduce some of the, the window sizes and things of that nature. Um, but what we decided to do is some very subtle things that would allow it to maintain its current uh, setup. And by that I mean these ribbon windows let the brick come up a little bit higher. But can we also take it a little bit back towards its historic roots? Most notably, can we restore the transom with some replication, not real, but replication um, leaded glass. And then over here behind this, and, and this was their idea, by the way, this wasn't even mine, was, was replication uh, glass block, which would be a very durable building, uh, building material, but it would also allow diffused light to come in, but it would be you know, resilient to, to damage. Um, and I should have mentioned this to all the property owners. I will send you the original JPEGs of the before and after. So feel free to take photos, but I'll send those to you as well. So we're going to start on the overall, and then we're going to zoom in on each side. So this is the after. And one of the things you may have noticed in the previous photograph is, is man, I feel sorry for you, but, but apparently a car ran into this corner of the building. And so you can see the pilaster that was here was, was knocked off. And so we're advocating in the after to either see if you can find replication material, and if not, just, just do it out of stucco, but to match. And then everything over here is not stone. This is just stucco to match the stone over here. And we simplified the detail to just have a few colored medallions. Now, the, the thing that, that I hope unifies it is, as you can see, once we put the, the, the replication um, transom, it has a terrible name, by the way. It's called crinkle glass, which I think is a horrible name, but, but still it works, is just painting all of this sort of this, this um, I would call it a warm bronze color. And because I think it just goes really well with sort of the pale yellow of the stone and it's just a, a nice relationship. And if you pay attention, those are the colors that you used in your projecting sign. And so just by virtue of painting the garage doors, um, you know, white, especially on a sun facing facade is always gonna be glaring and bright. So here you can see the details even better. And again, just like before, a canopy instead of an awning so that we can both get light above in the transom as well as protection for pedestrians and the storefront below. 
and then uh, bollards so that we can prevent cars from hitting your store again. <laughs> and then on the other side, again, this is just replication. Um, don't tell anybody, but it's plastic glass block. It's not even glass block, it's plastic. And then what I love to do is just simply take vinyl cling letters and, and apply it onto uh, the, the glass block so that you kind of get this really wonderful texture that bleeds through. And again, we're just picking up on that pale yellow that you had on your um, projecting sign. And then get over to the right, they want to develop the grassed lot into a parking lot so that patrons don't have to cross the street back and forth to get to their current parking lot. But guess what? This is my favorite side of their building. Now, everybody in the room, you have to make me a promise. If you have not gone into the lobby waiting room of their business, you must. It is literally a historic museum of the history of this place, the business, and its people. And it is wonderful. And as, make sure, you know, Craig or Wayne or Lauren tell you the story because it, it's just a fabulous, fabulous story. Well, the reason this wall is so important is this is what that wall looks like when you come from downtown towards Del Mar. I mean, you literally, the, 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 your, your view, your, your, the axis is terminated by their wall. And so it's a very, very, very important wall in the life of Del Mar. And so paying homage to their history, these are photos from their lobby, painted in a sepia tone, and it just kind of tells pictorially the history of their place. Thank you. And I apologize, I had to put your, the, the Collier Brothers auto body down here because I didn't want to cover up Craig's face, you know, so anyway. <laughs> Um, and again, Lauren, you asked about it, but there's, there's, there's the door in the side. And I, I just simply ran out of time. Again, this would be converted at some point into their, their parking garage, uh, parking lot. Uh, Carlton, where's Carlton? Can I get an amen? Is this not one of the best developments in your, in your district? I mean, I mean, not only is the architecture exquisite, but the art housed within it is just spectacular. It's world-class caliber, and I love the mission statement that you have for that place, Carlton, and, and, and my best wishes for you know, a successful future as well. He has ambition. Because it's been such a popular venue, uh, it is used almost equal parts as a gallery as well as a, uh, a meeting venue, wedding receptions, and things of that nature. But it has limited capacity in its current state, and so, again, this is his vision, not mine. Um, he intentionally left this development pad roughly 20 feet wide, 100 feet deep, so that he could create an auxiliary venue space that could either be freestanding or connect to the existing property and gallery. And so again, his program of work was to build on the existing architecture, and it, it just works. I mean, Carlton, when you give me architecture as good as you have, you know, any architect worth their salt should be able to do a good addition for you. All right, so... The same entry feature as the current Exodus Gallery, um, but on the top, it, it, it has a rooftop uh, space and outdoor dining, a mural that will just draw people's eyes up there. The access to the rooftop would happen uh, at the landing inside the building in the back. Um, we have string lights, and of course, underneath here would probably be tables and chairs and umbrellas. And then three roll-up garage bays, so that depending on the weather, you could either have indoor or outdoor spillover space but with some deep canopies to kind of help with solar protection uh, if the sun is too hot. But last but not least, we have Jolanda. We were talking colors, and, and she, she, not me, she came up with a great logo for, for this business venture. And I said, well, what colors do you like? She says, man, Bernard is my favorite color, i.e. her sweater. So pay attention. So her program of work here, this is just, man, I'm so excited about this. It, it's to be a combination. Um, Thrift store consignment shop, co-work space, and cafe. But she didn't want her cafe to just be limited to the inside of this building, but she wanted it to spill out on a rooftop above and to the courtyard to the side. And she also had a vision for a mezzanine that would kind of wrap around the interior. And so what you're going to see um, is we're going to raise the height of this building a half story so we can accommodate a mezzanine on the inside and then rooftop back animation on the outside. And so existing conditions, and here's the after conditions. And, and again, this is, there's Jolanda's orange. Look at that. So again, the, the program, the, these two, good Lord, I can, 
these two windows are at the mezzanine level, roll-up door for the cafe, entry into the co-work, roll-up for the consignment thrift shore. St shore. Um, upper floor dining activities, and of course, the side courtyard dining as well. Just to zoom in, again, this is Jolanda's favorite orange. Um, that is her logo, isn't that a great logo? And, and, and I think the name is very appropriate for, for the building itself. Are we gonna remix it and mix things up? Yeah, if you haven't read her mission statement for this property, you should. It, it's very, very inspiring. So again, before and after. So thank you so much for your time this morning. So wow, that was a lot, wasn't it? It was amazing. Let's give uh, Missouri Main Street and the consultants a uh, thank you for that. So what I, what I really want to emphasize, uh, I think a question that's been asked quite a bit is um, why Delmar Main Street? And really, uh, we see our function as advocating for all the stakeholders in the commercial corridor and uh, helping identify and secure resources to make some of these dreams a reality, right? Um, some of you may be like me. I've told this story before that growing up, driving along Del Mar as a kid in the passenger side, looking at some of these, especially some of the older buildings, and really wondering why they hadn't been renovated and why they haven't been improved. And uh, so in a lot of ways, this is kind of like an opportunity to answer that 30-year that, that question, right? Um, so these are the property addresses that we looked at. Uh, we only have one question so far. And I think I touched on it a little bit in the beginning. The question is, uh, how will we ensure that black businesses are not displaced along Delmar? Um, I have a couple answers. Number one, in the beginning I mentioned that racial equity is something that's important to us. And um, I'm really excited and proud that uh, across the board, all the board members, all the committee members have really been committed to that particular idea, okay? Um, I think it's important to uh, acknowledge people who have lived and owned property in areas when other people didn't want to be there, right? Uh, and in a lot of ways acted as stewards of those properties and spaces when other people didn't want to be there. Uh, so really it's a priority for us to find a way to make sure that all of us can enjoy a reimagined Del Mar, not just a select group, okay? Um, with that, I want to open the floor to see if there's any additional questions. Someone asked, uh, why does uh, development need to be housing? Um, I think what we've seen is some examples of mixed use, and I think a part of keeping a commercial corridor vital is that you have a, a range of, of, of uses, yeah. right? I'm going to keep it super and simple, yeah. right? Uh, would you agree? No, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I think also including the opportunity. So one, nationally, I, I, and I'm sure this is the case here, housing is an issue everywhere. Yes. Literally everywhere. We don't have enough supply. And so increasing the amount of supply is important, one, because we need it. Two, it helps provide customers built in for the surrounding district as well. Right. If I think each of us may have seen properties that we're familiar with, and we know some of the challenges around those properties or lots. If you take example, the, the very first lot that you showed that's uh, kind of like on the back end of a park and, and one end's on the, the front end of Del Mar, um, it's a great lot. It's underutilized, obviously, there's nothing there, and there's a ton of calls of service around that area. So creating something that's vibrant, something has people there on a regular basis would address some of those challenges that we've had with crime, right? Uh, I, the, the concept from a planning standpoint is, uh, they just call it eyes on the street. Yes. You know, cr crime doesn't like people around. Right. Uh, so the more people you have around, the less likely you are to have crime. I'm gonna take a stab at... Could rent, yeah. <laughs> I have an answer, but I'd love yours. Right. I think it'd be more diplomatic than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the question is, uh, could rents be raised uh, because of better units? So the, an the short answer is yes, you could do that. And I think the idea is you want to raise the quality, though, without, out, without pricing out the market. So, and you can do those, but you have to be able to do that in a, in a sense with, with a sense of subsidy. And again, that... The cost is what the cost is. You can't really adjust the cost a whole lot. Um, we certainly want to better the units in, in, in the area. And whether it's low-income housing tax credits or market rate housing or workforce housing, however you want, to, you want to describe it, one of the things you consistently want to do, regardless of community, is raise the quality of the product. And I think that's important to do. All right. 
I I think, I'd love to hear your, your not as diplomatic <laughs> answer. I think the other part of this is do we need higher income people in the corridor? I think the answer everywhere is that you want a community that is a good mix of a range of things. So again, we're not interested in displacement, um, the negative aspects of gentrification, but also with higher income people, we increase the tax base as well. So we need, we need to find a, a delicate balance between those two realities. Well, and, right? and I think some of the efforts you guys have already, have already started to undertake. When we were here in November, one of the things that we identified was we want to make sure that the residents of the surrounding neighborhoods are, are also the ones kind of making more money, increasing the local wealth. Yes. You know, and some of that is going to be through business ownership, right. you know, and property ownership. So, and, and, but the challenge there is that, you know, you've got um, parts of the district that don't that doesn't not, that does not have the same amount of net wealth as say the comparison I gave in November was you was U City. We need to be able to help build that local wealth, and we can do that through property, for, through property ownership of, you know, by by neighborhood residents as well as business ownership. And Lisa touched on this at least a little bit early on: is that the goal through the Economic Vitality Committee is to actually create some opportunities to educate people on. For example, we've been having kind of an extended conversation about how we get women and people of color. Um, uh, in a position where they can own more commercial property along the corridor, right? Um, for some of you that are business owners that may be leasing spaces, or you may have heard stories of people doing really well, and then there's a, re there's a rent increase. Well, if there's an opportunity for you to actually own a property, you can, you can be a little bit more stable, right? Um, so there'll be educational opportunities along the way to help people increase their wealth, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, sure, jump on in. Yeah, go for it. Anybody else have to do this? <laughs> so when were the reimagined properties built? What historical content exists? And what can we communicate? And what cohesive elements connect properties slash businesses along the corridor? Um, I may misinterpret the the intent of the question, but but my assumption is is the question is simplifying it would be how do we ensure that we honor the past while bringing these businesses into current times, um, and I think that's that's the issue that almost every thoughtful preservationist deals with on a daily basis. Um, I can only speak to the ones that I dealt with. Hopefully, you saw that in almost every instance. We tried to preserve as much material as we could. Where we couldn't, then we tried to achieve it with replication materials that honored the basic scale and design and intent of what was there before. Uh, but I do think, I would like to think of myself as a practical preservationist. And I think sometimes we have to understand the difference between a battle and a war. And, and I would rather us win the war instead of just an individual battle. And so I think we also need to make allowances for people in, in certain situations. Um, would we prefer a full leaded glass transfer to go back? Yes. Is that affordable? Maybe not initially. So let's allow replication so they can continue to prosper and do business where they are. In terms of the cohesive elements that unify these things, uh, it's already there. You know, the people that designed these buildings over centuries uh, if you just take a step back and look at historic photographs, you know, between materials, alignment of, heart, of, of elements and details, scale and setback, all of those things created a cohesive corridor. And so my, my encouragement is going forward, and, and if you remember some of the site plans that Joe and Russ developed, they paid homage to the fact that historically buildings would have been set to the roadway with parking behind as opposed to these seas of asphalt in front of them. And so to the degree in new construction that we can honor the basic principles of the past, we should. However, and, and I hope this doesn't disappoint serious preservationists in the room, I personally don't think we should try to pretend we're in the 1890s. And so I'm a big fan for the new construction to interpret those historic details and scale, but do it in a contemporary fashion that's respective of our current building methodologies and materials. So I, I hope that was the question. If it wasn't the question, clarify. Yes, Bob. To that point, the, the, the uh, alternative materials, let alone the you know, contemporary functions, does that affect 
ability to be a historic building or a historic district? It, it depends on if you're going to apply for historic tax credits or not. If it's simply going to be a, a contributing structure and you aren't intending to apply for tax credits, then, then no, you can use either one. But if you are going to try to go after tax credits, then you're probably going to have to adhere to the Secretary of Interior standards, which probably will require authentic materials to be used. We just saw all those wonderful pictures and everything, and we're so pleased. I was looking at each reaction from the property owners, so we're glad that you um, liked it, liked the pictures. But we don't want to just leave it at that. We're not going to say, oh, here's these great pictures, good luck. We're go definitely going to be working with the city and with Delmar, Maine, and anyone else that can help us bring those um, pretty pictures into um, reality. So real quick, I'm the developer for a very exciting part of Del Mar, Kings Highway to Taylor, uh, area that's been um, disinvested in for about 40 years. Uh, and it is just a beautiful part of town. In fact, it's actually an extension of the Central West End and it's only divided by Del Mar. So if you ride through Fountain Park, you see the exact same houses, the exact same stock. We're one of the uh, only communities in St. Louis that has a round in it. So when you talk about being a part of revitalizing that community, it is the most exciting thing I've done in my life. And energetic groups like this just give me the extra fuel I need to work through some of the problems as I transition from being a graphic designer to a professional beggar, I mean developer. <laughs> uh, but that being said, uh, Joe alluded to earlier some of the challenges we have uh, as developers, and believe me, he left out a few things that you have to watch out for. So not only your cost per square foot, not only your uh, lack of incentives in areas, but when you're developing in areas like Fountain Park, you're also up against crime, historic disinvestment, and believe it or not, banks still redline. So when you go after these banks to invest in these communities, they are not supportive on the front end. So we have to make sure that every single project that we've presented in these communities are not just there because it's a good idea, but it has to make economic sense. It has to make sense now, 10 years from now. It has to make sense to the, to the uh, neighbors that are living there now and the neighbors that are gonna be here 10 years from now. So in order to be successful in this neighborhood, we broke it up into 12 different potential projects, some that I would lead and some that we would attract outside developers for. Each project has a great deal of intention behind it. So as you can see to the left, that's Del Mar and Euclid. That's Del Mar and Euclid in the 1900s. It was a very dense, populated part of town. What's important about that is you see taxes, you see revenue, you see ways to generate wealth in that community. When you have a community that's been disinvested in, you have a lot of vacancy, you have a lot of open space, you have a lot of dis destruction of the historic fabric of these communities. When you have that, it makes it very difficult to present projects that work right now. So every project that we created, we had to think forward. Five projects that I'm leading along Del Mar will briefly hit are going to generate uh, upwards of about $89 million for the community going north. That means that the taxes generated from the new sales, the new businesses that come from that community, the new traffic is what's going to be key to revitalizing everything that we're doing where the houses are. Because believe it or not, it's all about the residents. If you don't even have roof, rooftops, you can't attract businesses. And if you don't have businesses, you can't attract new neighbors. So they work hand in hand. All in all, in, all, in all the investment is going to bring 400 new jobs to the community, and that's just the projects that I'm leading. That is not Call Your Brothers, that is not Remax, that is not some of the other, uh, Mr. Luckett, that's not bringing his business back. That's just the ones we're leading. With the addition of the existing business owners that are already there, we have a great deal of, uh, uh, of opportunity to bring this neighborhood back. Six million dollars uh, of our TIF is going to improve in the infrastructure of Del Mar. So everything from traffic calming, reducing four, uh, four lane street to a two year street, two lane street, adding bike lanes, sustainable landscaping, contemporary design for the aesthetics, enhanced security, everything that you see in the loop, we're trying to do in our section of Del Mar because that is the only way that we're gonna attract customers. We've also highlighted six very important parts of Del Mar 
to, to draw additional attention to. One is Delmar and Kings Highway. That's one of the highest traffic corridors in the area. So when we talk about how we're gonna do uh, the street call out, where we, cross, uh, uh, where we cross the street, how many people we expect to cross the street now and 10 years from now, that's a very important corridor. The second module is uh, Euclid in Del Mar. Euclid is very important because it goes from Fountain Park all the way to BJC. That's the artery. That's the artery that connects both sides of the street. So if you don't pay attention to how that area crosses, you miss an, you miss an outstanding opportunity to truly cross the Del Mar Divide because you want to push some of that wealth from the Central West End across the street. Uh, three is Del Mar and Baird. That's very important for two reasons. One, that little triangular shaped building right there, well, that's launch code. That's Jeff Mazur over there. They just put, you want to stand up, Jeff? <laughs> So Jeff represents six and a half million dollars worth of new investment in Found Park. Those are jobs. That's a place just like uh, Third Degree represents right here. We have one in our community. Jeff opens Lost Code. Yeah, give him a, a applause. Jeff has opened up Launch Code from day one for us to have public meetings. Some I've been popular, some I've been not so popular. But nevertheless, it's a place where the community can voice its concerns. And, get, and, and, and when you have opportunities like that in the community, you want to do everything to make sure that they are successful. So we're making sure that the crossing point part of Del Mar and Baird is a very important part of our development. Also, that street of Baird, the 700 block of Baird, we raised over $200,000 in partnership with Central West End Housing, and that block now is being scheduled to put market rate housing in that community. And that's in partnership with the wealthy side of the street. Uh, four is Del Mar and Walton. That's the corridor that's gonna have, uh, where we're gonna park our uh, par uh, parking garage, which I'll, get into a, which I'll get into in a little more detail in just a second. Fifth is the Del Mar Bend. It's where you start to bend and start to go east downtown. And six is Taylor. Six is the, the corridor, is where our corridor ends and my development rights ends. But you're about 50 feet from the Hodemont tracks, which we're looking at um, uh, seeing a new greenway. And that's gonna be a major turnoff for bikers. All right, so at Del Mar and Euclid, that's the first blush of our apartment building. Uh, we are wrapping up our financing now. That's 199 unit. It's really 200, but that top floor one is mine. So it's <laughs> 199 unit market rate apartments in our community. That community, that building sits right at the corner of Del Mar and Euclid. That street right there goes right into the, some, some of the highest value real estate in St. Louis. And when we fought, when I fought to have that building designed, everyone wanted the interest to be on Euclid so that it kissed the Central West End. But it effectively would have turned its back on North St. Louis. So with a, a lot of pleading and stomping my feet, we got the entrance to the building on Bayer. So now it faces North St. Louis and the lobby, the entrance, the grand reception of that building is on Del Mar, effectively named the bridge. As you can see, that's an example of the massing of that building, how much uh, uh, real estate it's going to take up from Euclid to Walton. That parking garage sits right at Taylor, which I talked about before, and faces my favorite project. So we just completed the financing for Elevation, which is our co-working space, office space, retail space, expressly designed for entrepreneurs. We're 100% sold out. There are 28 offices upstairs, downstairs, UPS store, Jamba Juice, a small cigar bar, and we're looking for our final eatery, which we're gonna hopefully do a contest on in the, in the coming months. And that little part that's poking out right there is called the Circuit Theater. So that's a 10,000 square foot performing arts theater. Now we can have small concerts, now we can have activity, now we can have lectures, things that draw energy into our community. Uh, that abandoned bank right there, we turned it into a banquet center. Uh, when we first got started, that was the unofficial homeless shelter of the community. There were about eight families living in there, lighting fires, trying to keep warm. We worked with the Central West End Security Initiative to get them placed at the St. Patrick Center. We worked with the Roberts Brothers to capture that building. We're only waiting on historic tax credits to begin that project. Again, the importance of tax credits is without them, you can't do projects like that. 
And they talked about that a little bit earlier, but that's a very important corridor at Del Mar and Kings Highway because that is the welcome to this district. If we don't take advantage of the opportunity we have while the current landowners are cooperative with us, we miss out on a fantastic opportunity to put a jewel and a crown on the entry to our corridor. And real quick, I know I'm rushing. This is Del Mar and Taylor. So that's that turnoff I told you about. You can see how close the Greenway is to it. Uh, we're negotiating uh, the purchase of a, uh, two properties right there at that corner. We're not quite there yet, but if we can come together on price, we have the opportunity to put a very major development uh, at the corner of Del Mar and Taylor. And we can't disclose who we're talking to now, but we're talking, talking about a $50 million investment in our community. And it is going to be minority owned and led by a very important person in this community who I can't disclose. But thank you very much. I hate to rush out of here. I'm very excited to be a part of this project. And if you have any questions, talk to Lisa. Good morning, everyone. It's exciting to follow Kevin because we've been together on this, this uh, Del Mar uh, journey for several years. Uh, well, he on one end and us on the other. But I, wanna, I think most of you have driven by the Del Mar Divine and you can see our progress. So I just wanted to take you quickly through it. For those of you who don't know, this is the reimagination of the old St. Luke's Hospital. It, we did turn it into a historic uh, designation and we have had to live with that historic designation. There are lots of rules and regs, but I think it was worth it because I love history. I love the history of this neighborhood. And I think this was an important um, uh, corner of the, of the, build, of the neighborhood. The, the real historic hospital, the hospital built in 1904, is hidden behind the building that was built in 1960s. But it's still there, I promise. Uh, so we're project status. We have 24 agencies and residents. And I want to say that what we were trying to do is bring human density to the neighborhood, creating apartments and office space that would bring people to the, the neighborhood so that they could now buy from retailers, eat in restaurants, take the mass transportation, really bringing people here. This is a, it's a nonprofit. Uh, think of it as a cortex for nonprofits. Um, that's really what it is, and we are a nonprofit. So our goal is to really just bring people there, allow them to rent at good rents, uh, in our apartments, in our offices, and thrive. Uh, their businesses, whether they're a nonprofit or they're a business on the on the main street, uh, to be able to thrive. 93% uh, of our, our space is under lease or LOI. Um, you can read this for yourself. Our restaurant will open up in the fall of 2022. It'll be sort of a throwback. This neighborhood from Easton to Del Mar had, um, four, the, we can count, 45 delis, uh, bakeries, markets, meat markets. So this is gonna be the deli divine and it'll be a restaurant that everybody will want to enjoy, a real New York style deli, great food, um, lots of fun, uh, lots of ways to sit and have a conversation. And then uh, Washington University is developing a minority incubator in our space. Uh, it's all finished f physically, but I think they're not opening until maybe uh, late in the summertime. And then partnering, we've been partnering with Ameren to install our, our solar canopy, which I think this is, uh, that you'll, it, it's not exactly like this, but over our parking lot, which will add to the uh, energy grid in the neighborhood. It'll keep the cars dry and warm in the wintertime, dry in the springtime when the rains are there, uh, but also really be an important uh, contribution. We believe in this. We're trying to be part of a, a sustainable uh, system here in our community. And if we aren't aware of that now, um, we have been not reading any news or listening, but, but being able to be uh, independent in energy is going to be important. Uh, so this is the, the edge, it's that WashU space that is going to be the incubator for minority uh, businesses. I think their first intention is to start with contractors uh, in the, uh, because that's one of the things that WashU and BJC use a lot of are uh, construction and they want to make sure that more people can uh, be successful in those ent entities. I'll skip through that. That's the sort of the floor plan of the main space and up at the, gr up at the corner of the green is an is a auditorium, a conference center that will be open for all of our tenants but also for meetings like this. We are really thankful to uh, Doug and the team for allowing us always to use uh, this space, but we also will have a space equal um, with all technology, all kinds of things that we can, we can enjoy, uh, the WashU space, and all the light yellow spaces are shared spaces. And one of the interesting into, um, things that we were able to do with the, the building space is when they put the new hospital, the new hospital, 1961, uh, on top of the 1904 hospital, it created those two green spaces. They were just dirt dumps. We hollowed them out and now they're going to be patios. So you can actually go outside, 
from inside the building. The light is unbelievable. And you'll be able to eat outside, talk outside, have a meeting outside. So that just really changes um, the atmosphere of the building. And then on the front space on Del Mar, there, those are retail spaces, St. Louis Community Credit Union, uh, Greater Health and Wellness Pharmacy, which is the first black-owned pharmacy in St. Louis by a young 30-year-old uh, young man who returned to St. Louis um, after college. And then um, we're working with an investment organization to be, bring opportunities so that people can invest in uh, their own futures right here in the community. Um, there's not much retail space, and then the restaurant will be entered from that small parking lot. They'll be all open to the public. All of that is open to the public. Let's see here. So this is um, our sort of uh, center core place that people can have their lunch, bring in, uh, put it in the refrigerator, put, heat it up in the microwave on the main floor, off of the main floor, and to the, to the uh, left of this is the uh, courtyard. So it doesn't look exactly like it'll look because there will be windows into the courtyard um, from here. This is the public concourse. This concourse, this uh, marble type floor here, it was the original hospital corridor, the 1904 hospital. So it's 265 feet long and 25 feet wide because it had to have gurneys go down it. So it actually um, goes all the way from, uh, Clara, from Belt to Clara, basically. It's a really long uh, connector. And it connects all of the 10 buildings that were built on this campus over the course of the 114 years. Um, th there won't be glass. There'll be walls there. Glass was just too expensive. Uh, and also the uh, historic uh, preservation people wouldn't let us do it. But it, it, it was sort of a good, good news, bad news story. They said we can't do it the same day we got the pricing for it. So we, it, it, made, <laughs> it made it OK. Um, then this is the co-working space. We're going to have about uh, 3,000 square foot of co-working space that is rentable on a monthly basis, uh, uh, weekly basis. However, it's not huge, but it's, it's really helpful because there isn't anything down in our area. And when Kevin opens up his, there'll be lots of new businesses for all of us to share and have spaces for entrepreneur, entrepreneurs to start their business. Mine, when I started Build-A-Bear, I did it at Kinko's. We, if anybody remembers the name Kinko's. That was where I went every day to print out my business plans and, and take phone calls and do all that. So now they're so much nicer and better. This is ours, or part of ours anyway. And this is uh, the opening to the residences at Del Mar Divine. It'll actually say the residence, the residences at Del Mar Divine. That's right off of Del Mar there. But our signs come next week, not the signs for the residence, but the sign for the, the, the two office buildings. And I'm so excited about that. But that's basically the de design. It's kind of an art deco, uh, and it was approved by Historic Preservation. And we did find a sign that was on the original building, um, not on the original building, on the, the Fowler building, the 1961 hospital that looked almost identical to this. <coughs> so they let us develop that. It's our reception area, if you come in now. Uh, missing art, but we're on the way to that. This is our lobby, which does look a little bit like a doctor's office, because it was a doctor's office. But um, it, it's going to get warmer as the art and everything comes in here. This is one of our conference rooms. There are 18 conference rooms throughout the building. Um, this is one on, on our floor, I think. Um, they're all open to, everybody can use the conference rooms that, that rents in the building. They don't have to have one in their office, although many people still did do that. <coughs> our goal was to create public spaces that everyone could share. So 18 conference rooms of, of various different sizes, uh, some for 40 people, some for um, uh, 10 people, some for four people. There's lots of choices. Uh, this is IFM, who has an office up on the fifth floor in, in uh, the larger building. They really did a lot with their space, and we, uh, we encouraged everybody to open up their space and make it bright and cheery, and they did. They put uh, medical professionals in uh, nonprofit locations, such as at, at um, Crisis Nursery, uh, some schools. They're really an amazing organization, and they moved out of Dave Campbell's house, where he'd been operating from, into our office space, so they're all thrilled to be here, and if that's on the fifth floor. Uh, just so you can see what one looks like. And these are some other spaces uh, around the building. Many of you have been on a tour, and you're all welcome to come. Um, just let me know when you want to come, and we'll organize a group tour, or we can, you can come on a one-by-one -one basis. But this is just some of, every individual tenant could do their space any way that they wanted. And this is a list of our tenants. Um, about a third are education, a third are health care, and a third are community development. And there's um, one really exciting one, entrepreneur for-profit, called um, Ch the Charity CFO. And she actually performs charity, uh, not charity, CFO services on a fractional basis for nonprofits. So any of you are here that run a nonprofit and are looking for somebody to help you with your finances, they perform like any other accounting agency would, but about, about a tenth of the price and do an incredible job. So they're in our building serving all these people. And there are a few not, new tenants on here that 
uh, you haven't seen yet, like iThrive, which runs the, the vans that go around to different school districts and provide children with eyeglasses. Uh, they're going to be part of our system. Uh, Soul Fisher Ministries, you, some of these names are very familiar. Others are, are <coughs> relatively new. We have a good mix of some young uh, uh, nonprofits and some that are very, very uh, uh, long term, like BHR, which does all of behavioral health response, which does uh, the now works with the city police and goes, the social workers go with the police uh, and it, it's really working. So everybody's really excited about that. Uh, so I think you can see there's uh, early child care, early childhood work going on in this building with United for Children and uh, Gateway uh, Early Childhood Alliance. We know that St. Louis was the first in kindergarten in the country and we've, that was it. That's all we did. Now we have to go back and start over and really start doing uh, a lot more for our littlest citizens. So I'm personally dedicated to that and we have a, a good uh, group of people here that are working on that. I'm going to turn it over to, to Matt because he's one of our tenants we're proud to have in uh, the Del Mar Vine Seed STL. Seed St. Louis, we're a nonprofit. I kind of want to give you a quick overview of who we are because we will be a new neighbor to the West End neighborhood and also we want to share then to one of our little projects for the neighborhood that will be a block off of Del Mar. For C. St. Louis, we were Gateway Greening last October. We changed our name. We've been around for 37 years. If you have ideas around growing food, we want to help you. And that was part of the challenge with our previous name. We have gotten away from flowers and plantings. We are all about growing food. So as we come into the West End neighborhood in the Del Mar area, if you have ideas about growing food, ways to do it, projects you want to take on, please reach out to me. Because that's part of our new vision going forward. That's why we changed our name. And I'll also admit, too, we changed our name to avoid the confusion with Great Rivers Greenway. We were tired of getting phone calls from people about trails and issues with trails. So it's been a clarification piece, too, for us. Essentially, we have four programs. Community projects. We help communities build gardens, school gardens, community gardens, urban orchards, and urban farms. And that's been growing for 37 years. We have a school program. It's gone a little bit quiet the past two years with COVID, but we're hoping this spring and into this fall it really comes back where we help teachers get the kids outside into an outdoor classroom in a much more direct way, both with science around growing food, but also just coming outside, getting tree stumps, setting up um, seats for the kids to come out, have a reading for English class, and then bringing in math, just trying to get the outdoor piece of their education. Because I do believe one positive during COVID, people realize the value of being outside and the healing power of nature too. So we want to bring a little bit of that more to the schools and then also to the West End neighborhood. And I'll say community education, another positive with COVID was a virtual realm for us. We did not expect this, but before with our educational classes for the community, we were lucky to get like 20 people, 30 people out for an in-person class. We were happy. Now it's to the point with virtual, if you don't get 100 people logging in, we're not happy. We had one class with some cross-promotion with the county library system. We had 600 attendees for Gardening 101. Again, I think during COVID, people realize the value of nature and growing food, and they want to learn how to do it, and we're here to help you do that. And the last piece, we have a, actually have a land trust. It's a separate structure under us, but we do own the property of 17 of our projects. We don't manage them. They're still community projects, but they're preserved for the future. Therefore, if they want to put in a water system, put in a pavilion, they know their land will not be sold out from under them in the coming months. So kind of a benefit for the long-term planning for the community. And just during COVID, too, just to give you a better realm of what we do, we've inherited the Global Farm from the International Institute. We now have the International Farm that we renamed it. And it's um, 35 international farmers growing foods that they want to grow from their home country in their own methods. It is a great site. We're hoping this spring to kind of do some tours of it now as it come out of COVID and really show it off. And last year, we did a partnership with um, American Heart Association, getting some small garden beds into daycare centers. Again, trying to get that outdoor education at the smallest level to get them all excited about being outside. And then as part of our move to the Del Mar Divine, we will, we have an online store right now, selling things that are hard to get here in St. Louis. We will have a retail space at the new facility we're building. We previously had four locations. If you're aware, we actually had a farm downtown on Pine Street. That's now the new soccer stadium. We had an office on Washington Avenue. We had a demonstration garden in Grand Center. And then not connected to it, we had an operations facility in Grand Center too. So our goal coming to the Del Mar Divide is to bring that all together in the one site and have it much more accessible in multiple ways. Um, I'll finish my thought first and I'll get back to that. Um, so with the Del Mar Divine, we already moved into our office in January and now the thought process is now to build a new demonstration garden because we have one grand center that we closed down last fall and opened a new one in the West End neighborhood. Quick little um, snippet here too. These are all of our projects. We have 250 projects across the region. 
we are expanding into Illinois. We actually got approval for Illinois two weeks before COVID hit. So we're still trying to build that market over there for new projects. But I keep saying that and tell everybody, we have 250 projects in our network. We don't plant them. We don't weed them. We don't harvest them. These are all community-led projects. So essentially, this is an overwhelming slide of all the partners that actually do all the work in the gardens. These are schools. These are churches, YMCAs, neighborhood associations. Part of our model is we don't sell our services out to people. We don't try to market our services to bring a community garden to a certain space. The neighborhood needs to be there first. We, we need 10 people. We need 10 people in your community, and we'll talk to you and take you through a thought process to make sure you'll be viable and sustainable because we don't do the work. It is the community's project, and it's your own mission. And I think part of this, too, is with your mission, it can be what you want. It can be growing food for yourself, growing food for your community, growing food for a food pantry. There are different ways for growing food and what you do with it. We will support you in doing that as much as we can with materials and education to get to your goals. And just overall, we have a lot of impact right now with the number of schools we're in, the number of gardeners coming into the network, and we are seeing under COVID more and more interest in what we're doing. So we do see a greater expansion going forward into more neighborhoods and into more schools. All right, Delmar Divine. We have our office already moved in. We're going to purchase 0 0.6 acres of land just on Enright and Clara. So we'll block off, block north of Delmar, and build a brand new demonstration garden. Our current one that was in Grand Center had a porta potty, was not fully accessible, and had limited hours of operation. So our goal with the Delmar Divine, since we'll be there, is to have it open more often, fully accessible, have nice restrooms, and also to bring in a classrooms piece to it too. And what's kind of nice for us to show off what we do is the fact that if you go on the west side of Clara, we actually have one of our own network community gardens right there, the Clay Community Garden. So it'd be kind of nice to say, there's a community garden you can go look at that's fully in operation. This is our first site plan. There is no construction documents. We're still getting input, but this is the plan for the site. And we, what we want to do with the site is to have it ever-changing. It's a demonstration garden. Part of our approach with it is things will work and things will fail. We want to try different ideas. We want to experiment and make it an ever-changing, exciting place to be. And it'll be open to the public when we have people there. When we have our staff is there, we will have it open to the public just to walk through and use. We even hope for the Delmar Divine Tenants to use it to come out for their meetings and enjoy the space and use nature to do whatever they're doing with their services. We are looking to build a small facility. I will say with a cost per square foot for new construction, we're, going to, we're, we're budgeting more than $300 per square foot. We're actually looking at probably $350 possibly 400 just to make sure we can build it, just because costs keep going up. And the fact that with this building too, we are looking at being as green as possible, both with the whole building itself and with the whole site. Out of memory. All right. Um, with the, can I go back? Can I go back. Um, with the site, there will be chickens. We will have no roosters, so all the neighbors will know they will be quiet. Um, but it will be a, a different pieces of both environmental experimentation, food experimentation, and different pieces of um, just interaction too. We do want to bring art in there. We will hope to host events there too. As part of the building itself, it'll be one indoor classroom. Therefore, the weather goes bad, we can go inside. The nice restrooms will have a bit of an operations facility there too, and some storage. Environmentally, we do want to look at the water, energy, and the land and the wildlife too. There will be a lot of pieces there for education and to things to take, you take back both either to your own garden at your home or to a community garden or another school garden and really kind of make it a destination of a, of a space to come learn how to grow food. And then with Delmar Divine, we want to grow. We want to have a greater impact in the region. We want to reach out obviously more to Illinois, keep growing the gardens that are here because a lot of gardens come back to us for expansion grants year after year. And to reach more kids. I think we're going to see more kids want to learn how to grow food. I'll say for my job, the best part of my job is going on a school garden tour. When you have that third grader walk you around the garden, the pride and joy that they show, what they've done, what they've grown, and if they grow it, they're going to try it, which is so important too. So we're actually exp expanding their palate to have healthy food be part of their diet. And the big thing is food access. Right now, if you add up all the growing space we have in our network, it's 2.3 million servings per year. We want to grow that too. It is a way to get healthy food into people, just for the physical health, but also using nature then too to help improve the mental health going forward also. All right, good morning everyone. I am Jason Johnson with Renaissance Development Associates, and I guess my claim to fame has been that I've developed now over 60 buildings in the Midtown Corridor of St. Louis, 
And because of that work and because of the fact that I live right behind here, I've been recruited by a couple stakeholders in this neighborhood in order to see if we could try to work some of that magic uh, in the Del Mar Maker District as well. And so we start, I started as uh, part of this team in October, and I think we were, we're um, well on our way to make some um, really great things happen. Um, uh, basically what this particular uh, portion of the district that I'm talking about is, is the Del Mar Maker District from Union to Kings Highway. And uh, the whole kind of premise to this particular part of the district is clearly making things. You know, we've got uh, made and made Magic House, and we've got Third Degree here, and there's a lot of really great things happening here uh, from a maker's perspective. But one of the things that are, that's really coming out of um, the interest of those things is also the education and the um, entertainment uh, components of those facilities. And so really the idea of the district is really to embrace not only making but also educating and entertaining. And so that's kind of our, the, the premise for us moving forward with kind of how we're looking at this particular part of, of Del Mar. And so one of the exciting things um, with one of the stakeholders that they're looking at doing is the uh, strip center that's on the uh, west end of the district. Um, there's a historic building on the corner and then um, there is a later addition um, strip center portion going east. And uh, the idea is for that to be a two-phase project. Uh, the first phase of that, you'll see on this slide right here, would be to tear down a portion of that strip center and utilize really good uh, urban planning practices in order to move that uh, part of the facility up to Del Mar and have it be a mixed-use development with both office and a restaurant component. Um, one of the things that I mentioned, you know, shouting out earlier, a huge proponent, a, a proponent of really good urban planning practices is also, you know, bringing the, those buildings to the, to the uh, street front, but also pushing the parking behind and really thinking about it from a mixed use development, but also making sure that we're thinking about engaging uh, the neighborhood as much as possible with putting people out on the streets um, uh, from a not only pedestrian, but like a seating perspective. So anytime that we're trying to bring uh, to the table a restaurant uh, of any kind, we're really trying to focus on making sure that there is outdoor seating that's visible from Del Mar in, in order to really make this neighborhood uh, feel as uh, active uh, as possible. So this particular project is now uh, in its pre-leasing stage, and as soon as we hit uh, a certain number number on that pre-leasing, that particular project um, that's there now will come down, and this and this will be built. So uh, we're very very excited about that. So it's on basically it's the east half of the um, now strip center that's on the north side of the street, right at uh, Union and um, Del Mar. All right, across the street from there. Uh, everybody's familiar with a um, old auto body and car wash building. And so what's we proposing with stakeholder is to turn this into exactly what I was talking about, um, a proposed microbrewery, but also a microbrewery that's going to be suited for an educational component, potentially uh, partner, a partnership with a brewing school. And um, so one of the things that's, um, that's important and that we've been talking about with regards to, to engagement in this particular neighborhood is really thinking about how successful it's been in order to bring kids down to this district with uh, Made Magic House. And so as we're programming the entertainment and education and actual facility of this with the food and the uh, beverage component, we're also uh, keeping in mind how important it is um, as a parent of three to be able to spend some time with, with your kids but also have a cocktail while they're being entertained with something. And so we're really thinking about the program of this facility where both inside and out you can actually um, watch your kids play different kinds of games, be entertained and be educated. And so, you know, there's a lot of, of, of places in the region where you can do either inside or outside. We're really wanting to, to play up uh, the idea that that can happen uh, in both capacities uh, from this perspective. And so um, we're full blown due diligence on this project right now. And that's one of the, of the projects that is kind of at the forefront of getting pushed forward as soon as possible. So we're really excited about, um, about moving that forward. Uh, the next thing is the building at 5000 Del Mar going all the way the, to the other end of the district. So that is the old Boost Mobile building and it was a convenience store um, that was acquired with these stakeholders because it's such a prominent uh, intersection uh, where we really need to be able to make a statement of what this district really is, is going to um, bring to the table from a personality perspective. So. Uh, about half of the building is being is getting ready to, to get cleared out and go under demo. There's some really exciting um, uh, things going on from the design side to 
to do an addition uh, on part of the site, pushing it to the street. But part of the, the global idea for this facility is to incorporate how we really uh, bring this building in uh, to the table as a um, uh, kind of a primary entrance uh, for the district. And so somehow, um, way, shape, or form, the idea of the brand of the district is really going to be displayed uh, with regards into the architecture of this particular facility. And then with regard to what it's actually going to end up being, we want to make sure that we're programming it in a way that's going to stick with the mission of the district um, and also be something that's going to engage the community. So we're excited about that. Uh, ironically, the building right below this is an old barber shop that was going out of business, has been acquired, uh, the demo is completed, and ironically, the restaurant tour, which we're one insurance clause away from signing that lease, so I can't, can't say it quite yet, maybe at the end of the week, uh, is a gentleman that was actually catering the very first event for Delmar, Maine. He is born and bred in this neighborhood, he has, he's had other location, and is super excited to get back to this neighborhood. We've worked with his mom and to bring a, a restaurant uh, back to where it kind of all began. And so this building actually uh, has the two lots adjacent to it. So getting back to the theme of making sure that we're engaging the neighborhood as much as possible with um, outdoor seating. It will have a big patio. It's going to have, um, for, for that out, outdoor seating component, uh, and then the upper two floors we think are going to be uh, Airbnbs in order to offer that to the neighborhood that we don't really have right now. Um, so we're super excited about that. Um, that construction should start really soon. All right, another uh, larger project directly across the street from here, right behind us, uh, is a, uh, a new construction project, mixed-use project that would be, that's going to be uh, 42 uh, new construction uh, apartments and an expansion of the success of the um, Makers Building, right? So the idea is as these company or as these people are, are working with uh, in the makers facility as they're um, fine-tuning their product and, and actually as they have the ability to really bring something to the market uh, This particular project on the first floor is going to bring a workshop and retail Opportunity to these people in order to basically take the next step uh, in what they're that what they have been trying to produce uh, as a startup through uh, the makers building and so we're super excited about that and we'll also have a separate little retail uh, opportunity uh, in order to promote the products that they're that they're um, producing outside of what they're doing in their workshops and then on the west end uh, another restaurant space that will have outdoor seating the really cool thing about this particular uh, project is you can see that it also has um, from a site plan perspective a, a tie-in with Enright. so uh, this project is adjacent to um, there's one building between adjacent to uh, made magic house um, but the whole idea of knitting this community together uh, is we're wanting to uh, make a major play on tying Del Mar to Enright and, what, and um, tying what's happening on Enright with um, part of our team and redeveloping some of the homes up there is to do a pedestrian walkway and then bringing you know, a more park-like uh, setting to kind of continue to knit this community together north and south. So we're su super excited about that. Uh, and that will be um, eight new construction homes that are um, also have two car garage slash workshops in order to continue this theme of helping incubate that whole idea of making in this community. So we're very excited about that. This project actually, um, we did a, a light tech application for, so it will qualify as workforce housing. So it'll be subsidized. Only way, again, we can make the numbers work uh, from that perspective. We just barely missed getting approval this year. There's a couple little things that we can, that we're gonna tweak within the facility, which we think pretty much assures us, hopefully, knock on wood, that we're good for this year's all allocation so we can get going on that. So everybody keep your fingers crossed because that's gonna be uh, huge for the district. One thing I'll also mention that this, we're, we're going fast and furious down here as quickly as possible with trying to uh, bring things to the table. The Craft Alliance building, actually, that's been done in the recent years, we also have a deal that actually is inked. It's a company of, of, um, that's called Brew Tulum. Uh, they already have a, a, a project down there uh, that they're bringing to the table. It's going to have a small little roasting facility, again, to, for, for the education and makers kind of component. It will also have outdoor seating, and it will actually uh, complete uh, what was empty retail spaces in the Craft Alliance building. Craft Alliance also is expanding uh, into the last little retail spot. So uh, there's, there's lots of things on the move and a very kind of exciting time to see all this kind of happen and, and gel together uh, in the district. So 
Thanks everyone for your support. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Rogers and I'm here to present uh, on behalf of Bi-State Development Metro Transit on our Community Mobility Hubs program. Um, first and foremost, I have been a huge fan of the West End and all of the work that they've done. I've kind of been floating in the background of a lot of the community meetings for six, seven years now and they've and essentially grew in my career and I'm still sticking with working with them. So thank you for allowing me to work with you all. Uh, also, about three or four different presenters said Metro do this or Metro do that. And this is the mic drop right here. That I'm about to show you this is the mic drop. That's why they put me at the end. So um, without further ado, our Community Mobility Hub program. All right, so before I dive into what the Mobility Hub concept is, uh, let me give you a little background on what happened before. So prior to the pandemic, Metro went through this huge planning uh, initiative to reimagine, that was the name of the program, Metro Reimagine, reimagine our routes uh, and essentially create high frequency transit routes, get people to where they need to go a lot faster. Uh, and the pandemic hit. It was actually working out pretty well, pandemic hit, and you all know how that's impacted transit all the way up until now. Uh, so we wanted to build this core out, uh, and throughout this process, we actually identified um, high transfer points within the entire network. And when they found this out, they, they figured, okay, how do we capitalize on these transfer points? So they, I say they because at this time, I'm not working for, for Metro. I'm somewhere else. Hey, Matt. Um, so they go after this federal grant to implement community mobility hubs at some of these transfer points. And this grant, um, it's not a huge amount of money, especially enough to hit each one of these dots. It's a lot, it's a big network. So um, they essentially create this long list and it ends up being about 40 different uh, intersections and say, okay, we're gonna do this project. Then I get hired and uh, they say, Brian, take this and make this thing happen. So um, it's in our hands now, uh, and initially it was just all based on ridership numbers uh, and like what's best for the network, and as I said, the transfer points. But I wanted to kind of put a different spin on it and look at, okay, what's the uh, surrounding socioeconomic status, the demographics attached to it, the land use attached to it, and essentially prioritize this list on where we can have the most impact on the people. So, uh, we ended up getting down to a list, and I'll go uh, over those ones that we want to focus on first in a minute, but we wanted to ask these questions, and like I said, we hit the land use. We wanted to also reclaim space for transit because we have a bunch of very wide streets uh, that could be a lot safer if we made room for, for buses. Uh, improve access to all modes of transportation. So one of the big things for Metro will be how do we look at ourselves in this new world of getting around. Um, people are working from home so that they're not necessarily hopping on the bus to go to, to offices. People are riding scooters. We got electric this. We, like everything's kind of changing. So what do we do to uh, stay relevant and stay impactful in the community? We want to build a sense of place. Um, one of the biggest things when it comes to riding a bus is restoring dignity and being a bus rider. We want to be more than just a pole in the ground or a bench on a sidewalk or a, a shelter that, that needs to be cleaned up. So how do we go about doing that? Uh, and these pictures show all of those things. Uh, yes, that is a bus shelter with plants growing on top of it. Uh, we want to be able to provide more information to riders, so like real-time information, not just you know the pamphlets that you can pick up anywhere. How can we do more? So back to those spots that we prioritize. So looking at the grant funding and what it, the cost, which we've, everyone's talked about, we wanted to try to get this down to uh, spreading the love geographically and like spots where we could create the most impact. So it, we flushed these locations through a number of different filters, as I mentioned, and also um, looking at other agencies and what they have going, other development opportunities and what they have going. And we actually created this list before Delmore was designated a main street. Uh, so I feel like we got it right. 
Um, and also, before uh, West Florissant got uh, their funding through their grant, we looked at West Florissant and Bell Fountain. So we're like, we, 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 had, we had the right idea. So this all happened really fast. Uh, I'd say about maybe six months ago, we had some focused external uh, stakeholder meetings virtually. We've walked the area. This is actually us walking Del Mar and Union. Study the area, there's a ton of stops. We've actually had uh, internal stakeholder meetings where we talked to bus drivers and said, okay, what, does this make sense? Like, where do you guys see this fitting in? And then we uh, heard from residents and that, and that they may have some interest on doing some other types of traffic common uh, aspects to this. So we decided to shift the location. Oh, and actually this picture right here at the very bottom, uh, when we were walking the site, I was standing on the, uh, the south, yeah, the southeast side of the street and I look over and this kid comes zooming down the street on a scooter, hops off, throws the, the scooter down, and hops on a bus. So it's like, he's already doing it. We just haven't put the infrastructure in place. So, like, it fits. But, um, so we, we looked over the site and found out the residents might want to do some more stuff, so we changed the location. But the site is Del Mar Union, so Missouri Main Street, like, yes, we, we hear you loud and clear. But um, this is what we had initially planned, uh, and it may still happen, we don't know. We, ha we had this initially planned for Del Mar and Union. And don't get caught up on the type one, type two thing. That's essentially based off how much space in a right of way we have to play with to make it easier, because if we start cutting into private property, it's a, it's a different issue. It might take a little longer depending on you know, who you're dealing with. So this is what we had planned for the space. As you can see, there's uh, bus pull-in lanes, uh, basically consolidating that street and making, making room for transit. After we heard about the potential of different traffic common measures at this intersection, we switched it and only one person who's not, no longer in his room has seen this picture. So I don't know how, maybe he talked to Missouri Main Street or what, but this is the uh, potential site for at Del Mar and Kings Highway. That's the, that's the Aldi's parking lot. This is exactly where they, suggest, they suggested that we put this. And um, this type three situation right here is for a location where we have more space to play with. And the plans were, well are, to partner with uh, Pocket Parks, which is a local nonprofit here in St. Louis, and the Brookings Institute to uh, incorporate what they call playful learning landscapes. So this area would be essentially a, play, a park where kids can do stuff like play giant sized Jenga and chess and stuff like that and wait for the bus. And whatever we do on these, uh, these different corners will match, but because this is a much busier intersection in Del Mar and Union, this is going to be um, a lot more innovative in, than just making bus pull in lanes. So we're gonna have to look into uh, doing like transit signal priority and stuff like that to make it more convenient for, for everyone, not just the buses, to get in and out of this intersection. But I thought it was hilarious that they kept saying, hey, put one right there. That's it. So, uh, but because of the shift uh, in location, it sort of pushed uh, the Del Mar Kings Highway location back down the list as far as which one we'll do first. Which isn't, a, which isn't a bad thing. We'll have time to work out the kinks at the other locations. Now, this is the one that's going to be focused on first because of the partners in place. Um, this is a very good example of what can happen when everything comes together and everyone talks. We have support on the federal level, uh, local, uh, local and state agency to uh, put different energy, funds, and everything towards this uh, intersection. And I don't know how well you all can see it, but the colors are just a suggestion. We're actually gonna link up with the community and work with them on how to incorporate their, their personality into this intersection. Uh, and there's actually banners right here on each side of the street. We're trying to figure out what is it that we can, what piece, what art piece that we can put at each intersection that 
is the same, but can showcase each neighborhood. So when Lisa mentioned, oh, you know, Vaccine is working on banners, this could possibly be where we showcase the entrance to the Delmore corridor all the way down if we put this at Delmore and Kings Highway. But like I said, mic drop, we're working on it, we have arrived. <laughs>